And now, joining the conversation is Chiweze Hebuzo, the Senior Manager, Disruption and Innovation, PwC Nigeria. You're welcome. Hi, Lekon. Good morning. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to represent. Uh, let's, get, let's get right into it. Nigeria has a large pool of young talents in the country and also a huge number of highly intelligent citizens in, uh, at home and in the diaspora. Now, do we have a regular or current statistics of this poll? Um, so I think that the very sort of simple answer to that is, is no. I mean, it's particularly tricky to sort of keep track of uh, data uh, in Nigeria, especially with regards to diaspora and movement. I mean, there's a popular figure quoted being around 15 million. However, the United Nations Department of um, Economic and Social Affairs puts that number at, at 1.75 Niger uh, Nigerians. So it's a bit, you know, uh, contradictory numbers because it's not easy to, to keep track of that. But I think what's important to focus on and what's sort of the main, uh, I, I guess, issue is the impact of these diasporas, regardless of how many they are. So how much they are remitting to the country from, from, the, from, from wherever they are. All right. Now, according to the report, Nigeria possesses a huge amount of resources that we can call brainiacs. So which countries are the most preferred destination and which development spaces are in high demand for Nigeria's immense talent and, of course, possible forex uh, uh, inflow into the country? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so, I mean, if you think about it, we're really considering two countries in two continents. So let's say Europe and North America. But I think particularly Europe, where we have the average age of the citizens in, in that continent of over 40, whereas Nigeria, we have an average age of, of, you know, below 20. So, I mean, and that continent or that sort of um, the countries in that space have a lot of jobs, whereas Nigeria, you know, the, we know that there's a problem with the number of jobs we have and not being able to sort of uh, meet the graduates that we're producing. So clearly, Europe will be a great place to to export our brains into. There's also, there are also advantages around, you know, being on the same time zone and again uh, requiring, you know, English to work in in some of these countries, which is something that you know is 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 the sort of um, general language of Nigeria. You know, so it's it will be an easier transition to Europe. There are also conversations around uh, North America and Canada. Again, there's also growing demand for that, particularly in the software engineering space, where we know that. Um, there's projected to be about 45 million jobs in the software development space by 2030. And that number is currently, we currently have about 28 million um, as of today worldwide. And we're saying, uh, can we, you know, contribute to that number? We, we think Nigerians can actually play a role in, even if it's adding 2 million to that number um, to, to, to meet the demand, the growing demand for software development jobs. So software development is one, um, one area uh, in terms of programming jobs and things like that. But there's also, there are also other things, um, particularly around BPO. So when we think about legal services, you know, um, architectural services, and even some medical services as well, accounting services, and things that can be um, done remotely without having to physically leave the country. Uh, uh, what is Nigeria's best developmental path uh, towards prosperity, given its unique uh, circumstance and, of course, its position in the world today? You've talked about the fact that Nigeria has got a brain export potential in Europe, in North America, in South America, and in other continents. So, uh, in your firm's report, you proposed developmental path. Can you just walk us through it, looking at the immense potential that Nigeria has? Sure. So, so in the paper, we, we say, um, you know, the traditional path to development is typically, and this is a path that has been followed like, um, by, by countries such as China, Taiwan, you know, South Korea. And it starts with low-end manufacturing, then it goes to high-end manufacturing before you start exporting services. And we're saying, why don't we skip all of that? We live in a current time where um, we don't need to like, necessarily follow the same path that these countries have gone through. And particularly because, first of all, those paths take a long time. I mean, in the case of countries like uh, South Korea and, and Taiwan, if they, take over, if they took over 50 years, right? And we don't have that time. Uh, and we're saying, you know, this part also requires a lot of investment in infrastructure. And if you look at Nigeria's infrastructure deficit, I mean, there the, the are figures floating around saying that we need to spend about between uh, 100 and 150 billion dollars consecutively for the next 10 years to be able to bridge that deficit. So we're saying, while yes, it's important to still look at, you know, the traditional path, you know, the focus should be on this new path that we're proposing, which is through exporting high value services and inserting Nigeria's into global value chains, because we think. It's an easier path, it's quicker, and it's something that we can see uh, real realizable benefits almost immediately. And even from an investment perspective, it's easier to convince a foreign investor to say, um, let's, uh, let's invest in sort of setting up infrastructure or, you know, or policies to, to um, enable exporting of brains. Whereas if you look at uh, following you know, investment in manufacturing, that's a very risky space. Um, it's not a very attractive space. I mean, the, the focus for Nigeria is mostly for, from a manufacturing or exporting perspective is really around crude and agriculture. 
while agriculture is great, we, we can't be competitive right now with the, with the infrastructure we have, you know, and so exporting agricultural products, you know, physical goods in that, in that sense will not work in, in, in the short term or in the medium term. What we're proposing is let's export brains. This is something that is already happening both on an individual level. We have Nigerians also inserting themselves by, you know, without any government intervention. And we're saying, you know, if you just think about it really, our asset, what's the greatest asset of the nation? It's Nigerian brains, right? And we spend a lot of money trying to export, you know, um, other assets like crude, agricultural produce. Why don't we also, you know, um, spend some money in exporting brains as well? And, and you know, uh, because that's more feasible, that's more viable, it's the quickest path, and it has, you know, less resistance from a risk perspective as well. So, invariably, are you saying that if a proper formulation of feasible policies and, of course, uh, channeling funds appropriately into this particular area, Nigeria can actually achieve a global superpower status economically in the next uh, 10 to 20 years? This is what you're saying. Uh, well, that's our position. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, really, um, we know that there's a market for jobs. There's a need for jobs. And well, we know that, and in, in our report, we sort of detail the average income or average earning for the different sort of jobs that we will be proposing to export, right? And we were very, very conservative with those numbers. Almost, you know, being saying that the Nigeria would not maybe earn as much as what the, what the, um, the citizens of that nation earns. And the figures we came up with, based on our projections, we, we said 2 million Nigerians inserted into um, global value chains. And that's an easy, that's a number that we can easily achieve, especially if we spread it across the 36 states. So if we're intentional about maybe um, over the next five years, building up skill, building up capacity, improving the brain capital of Nigerians to be able to participate in these GVCs, then it will be easier for us to achieve that target of inserting 2 million uh, Nigerians. If you think about it, why, if we have 10,000 from each state over the next, every single year, uh, we have 36 states. That's, I mean, I'm just being conservative here, here as well. But the point really is, there's a lot of potential. We have a lot of people. There's a lot of talent in, in Nigeria, and it's something that we should tap into as a nation. Well, you're saying that Nigeria has a lot of talents. Uh, well, that, that cannot be disputed, or that can be disputed by, by some people. But then, uh, what medium skill opportunities are there in Nigeria? I would like you to break it down uh, that you believe can be improved for, upon uh, to further scale up brain exports to other countries. Okay. So I think there's a, there's a tendency for you to think, oh, people who are sort of inserting themselves into these high value chains have gone through um, you know, formal education and they've, they've had to go to school and they've had to spend four years in university. We're saying that there are some jobs within these GVCs that do not require formal edu education. Yes, they require some form of training and upskilling, but it doesn't require you spending, you know, the same period of time as you would, uh, it, let's say, if you were studying an engineering degree and things like that. For instance, if you think about, um, you know, uh, call center services, that's something that requires minimal sort of uh, technical skill. It's really just something... Um, People can pick up through training, maybe a three-month training program, six-month training program at most. And it's really around the, you know, from the experience that you, you develop capacity in that. So there's no need for formal education for that sort of thing. So it's about getting people, upskilling them to be able to deliver that service. That's one example. Another example that is really, really catching on is the animation space. I mean, um, we have a lot of young, talented Nigerians who are coming up with different, drawing, you know, coming up with different animations, coming up with comics. And if you look at a country like Japan, which is like the major exporter of sort of animation, I mean, their population is actually the, the, the 20, tw about 28 percent of their population is over 65, right? And you know, so in, essentially, they don't have a young population. So there's going to be a growing demand for people with animation animation skills to be able to tap into that market and and build sort of um, you know help uh, um, come up with build animations, build video games, and things like that. So that's another example. And if you think about it, do you really need to go to university to learn how to you know? Um, build a video game. It's something you can pick up online, you know, get a course and, uh, and, and, and you know, learn how to build it, sort of being self-taught, right? And if you also think about the requirements to, to help you um, learn those skills, it's not a huge investment requirement. I mean, people talk about power, there's no light um, or there's no internet. And while, yes, that's true, the internet is a challenge, uh, power is also a challenge. But if you think about solving that problem of power, we're not, think, we're not solving it from, a, from this, at the same scale as a, at the manufacturing level where you would need to have significant investment. If you think about it, what does an animation expert need to work? He needs a laptop, he needs a power bank that can charge his laptop, he needs a, you know, a modem, and that's pretty much it. So we're saying this is a viable path, and this is, we think, you know, it's the, it's the most viable path for, for Nigerians to achieve that. 
Economic say, superpower sir, status. Yeah. All right. Well, you, you say it's the most uh, viable path. And of course, uh, to some people, it is sweet in the airs when you talk about uh, brain exports, um, scaling up a developmental path. But then some people are saying that Nigeria needs more of its brains and skilled manpower to improve our economy and even the social political space. So do you think what is important right now is brain export or brain import? Because the conversation is centered around, should we export these brains while we have brain drain um, situation in the country? That's an interesting question. Um, so, I mean, to answer that, let's, let's think about the current situation and let's paint the, the, the real picture here. The fact is there are no jobs in Nigeria or there are not enough jobs, right? So even if you're importing brains, where are they going to come and, you know, where are they coming? <laughs> there, there are no jobs for them to do when they come back here, right? That's not to say that you can't sort of tap into, a, again, you know, we live in a world that is highly advanced. There's a lot of technology. That's not to say you can't tap into people who are in the diaspora. You can't uh, tap into or get ideas from them. You can't. They don't have to be physically uh, lo located here to do that. So we can do both. And if you think about it, our, what we're proposing, which is really around brain export, enables brain import because the person is physically here working virtually for a multinational company. He's learning things. He's acquiring skills. And he's, guess where he's going to apply those skills or those learnings? It's going to be here. So invariably, we're still importing, if you think about it. So uh, I think to go about being intentional, uh, to get people to come back to Nigeria. That's something that can be done at a sort of company level. Where, and we see companies doing that. We see hospitals bringing people back, paying them to come back and work. And that's good, and that's really commendable. But majority of Nigerians um, you know, left Nigerians for different reasons. Some of them around you know, security, some of them around bet better life, and, and what, what have you. And we're saying we need to solve those issues first before we can even come up, um, start investing heavily in, in in bringing them back from a government perspective. Well, what we're saying is let's be intentional about exporting the ones we have here uh, to be able to provide services globally. Well, has there been any sort of forecast or look into the future to see if there are impending challenges that might inhibit um, this um, innovation? And are you thinking of um, a possible way out of it? Sure. So, I mean, there, there, there are definitely challenges. I mean, uh, we've talked about the broadband, we've talked about power, we've talked about, um, I mean, even the situation going on with ASU, which, 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 which is currently a mess. So, I mean, there are challenges. However, there are also workarounds around that. I mean, like I mentioned, if you think about the investment required to power up a, a single in, you know, individual who's going to be doing animation, it's, it's tiny compared to what you would need to sort of kit up or fully equip a farmer to be able to, to produce at a competitive level, you know, globally. So um, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's something that needs to happen and it's something that needs to start happening quite quickly. All right, uh, Chiwese, uh, some people are speculating or thinking that this might just be a big shot at further diversifying the Nigerian economy that is moving from the um, export of low-value adding products like crude oil, and you also uh, mentioned agriculture, that is to exporting brain capital and probably earning foreign cash. So do you think uh, this is a viable means of um, getting that done? Absolutely. I mean, it's really around treating education or brain capital as an infrastructure, right? So... We tend to um, look at you know, investments in education as sort of like from a social perspective, but it's actually an infrastructure, right? especially in this um, digital economy age that we live in. And um, yeah, it's something that we should, um, we, need to, we need to be uh, in, intentional about putting money into that space to try and get the best, out of, uh, the, the best, the best value out of it. All right, uh, finally, before I let you go, uh, talking about intentionality, what are those uh, workable feasible um, implementations, or let's say um, policies now, yeah, policies that you think um, the government can bring on board if it hopes to have this done and transform its economy? Okay, so we're actually going to put out a second paper that details this, you know, in, in sort of full extent, right? Um, but if you think about what we're proposing, let's, there are actually five major things that we need to focus on. And whatever policy, whatever um, initiative we come up needs to support these four things. And the first one is brain capital. Right? And that speaks to technical skills, soft skills, and mental health. Right? And creating policies to drive that, you know, to, to, to improve that, to maximize that. So training centers, be intentional about that as well. Then there is also broadband, which we've spoken about. And that needs to happen. So in terms of things around the right of way, laying fiber cables, and things like that at a federal level, right? that needs to happen. Um, then there's also the power bit. Again, thinking about power from an alternative power perspective, right? and being um, sort of coming up with policies to support 
um, driving to support people uh, to be able to have a, you know power to power their devices to, to, to be able to, be, to work in these GVCs. Then there is also the policies that need to happen on the government side. So when you think about tax, where are they going to be paying tax to? Is it coming to Nigeria? Are they going to share with the other country? What sort of double, double treaty arrangement are you coming up with? And then finally, there's devices, right? Because to, to tap into GVCs, you need devices, right? And then we, it's really about thinking, what can we do? What can the government do? Or how can the government support policies to make sure that devices can be in the hands of Nigerians very easily, very affordably, without breaking the bank for them? So I think those, those, those things need to happen. And in our second paper, we detail, uh, we provide more content uh, you know, around those those. those, um, those, those well, definitely, Chiweza, we will be looking forward to that second paper. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure.